My friends, we're still in this life. Verse 7 says clearly, doesn't it? Early in the book of Ephesians, it mentions the age to come. That thing, it's almost that Hebrew, Hebrew way of dividing everything into current and future. Two realms. I don't know what the divisions mean here as far as age is plural, but it seems to imply future. You and I had better plan our lives in faith, under God, with some knowledge that it matters. Did you know that actually everything matters? Some things are clearly, and here's where true proper discrimination comes in, clearly some things matter more than others. But our lives matter today. God has a plan for us currently. My friends, he has a plan for us for the future, and it will not be pleased. No, I love those verses we read early in Revelation about the praise and around the Lord, but that will not be the entirety of our experience after this life. What will it entail? Let's look further in our text. That in the ages to come, he, now who is that he? I was so tempted to make that H in he a capital. But, and many, and many things, that is my habit. But I figured here I am actually using a version, and the version doesn't use the capital H for these pronouns. And uh, maybe I should be careful about you know, copyright, potential copyright troubles or something. I, I'm not sure anybody would ever know this, but you know, I, I, I try to be careful about what I'm writing in this way. And I want you to know I've got a small H there, but maybe it should really be the, a capital H because that he is God. Doesn't God deserve a little bit better of us that we ought to give him a little more recognition? I'm afraid he does. We can never praise him enough and extol him or raise him as high as his due. But here we have a small age. Who is that he? It is God. That in the ages to come, he, God Almighty, what will he do? By the way, he's always doing. He's always busy. No day off. That he might show. That he might show. And we'll look at what in just a minute. But did you know that God is a showman or a show God? Look at the revelation he has given to us and showing us even of himself as we look at nature. We look at nature, the things of creation, and with but a little discernment, a little inclination, we see such marvels. The glory of a cloudless sky. The glories of even a cloud filled the sky. Cumulus, big, nimbo clouds that are so Magnificent, speaking of, I believe indeed our God, the brightness, the power of the sun, even the coolness of the full moon last week for was a day. Woo, we had a clear night and it was so beautiful. Our God made all of that. Our God, he's busy, he's always busy. He's always showing himself forth. Our verse says that he might show. Let me tell you about a show coming to New York City. In April, you can buy tickets, by the way, for groups. I'm not sure you can for individuals yet. But the King Tut exposition, the, the King Tut antiquity pieces, 80 of them will be here at Madison Square Garden or in a theater near there. The old Times Square building is where it's going to be. They've taken over floors there. It only costs 30 bucks or so. And what a chance to see relics from the pieces of art from King Tut's tomb. And present will be one of the sarcophaguses, gold and jeweled, that his body laid in. For thousands of years, he died but as a teenager. The last time, well, recently, was down in Philadelphia. At a great museum there, and 1.3, 1.4 million people came to see these pieces of art. An exhibition, not an exhibition, a showcase. 
of many of the things of Egypt and of their thoughts of the afterlife. And of course, a little bit about King Tut himself. 1.3, 1.4 million people visiting. And how many will visit? Currently, it's in, I believe, San Francisco. It's touring the country. It's been many years. I think 79 was the last time this exhibit was here. It is a showcase, a reflection of truths or at least thoughts of that era. It has value without the visit. Let me tell you about another exhibition. I understand this was at the South Street Seaport recently for a period of time. It's called Body World. A German professor found a way to change the character of the human body as far as, say, the carcass of or the body of an actual human being and change elements into colored representations that give a real representation of what it's like. So what you do is these really blown bodies or cut bodies apart, real human bodies, and he has displayed their insides so that you see almost what a medical doctor would see in a, a room of cadavers and preparing to be a doctor. And there you see the bone and the ligaments. You see the brain in a body. These were real people, real bodies. There's a backlist of people who want their bodies to be part of these exhibits, believe it or not. And you see they're represented. It's in the exhibition. You begin to see, hey, you've never seen the brain quite like this. And apparently one of the outstanding scenes in this exhibit as it goes all over the world is a body who has been, that has been treated like this. Every bit of skin of that body is flopped over the arm like a towel of the person that was a real human being before. Wow. You've seen probably at bus stops in the city here or on the train some posters representing such an exhibit, such an exhibition. Just the pictures from a distance sort of revolt me. I, I had it reconfirmed, I don't think I could ever be an MD. But the truth is, there's an exhibit. I want to suggest to you this morning that right now, in this world today, we are exhibiting, in a way, for him, his gospel, as it has affected our own lives. We today are living, and we are living, moving, breathing exhibits of the grace and mercy of God. And here in verse 7, Paul writes to the Ephesians and to us and says, this will be part of what even eternity is about. Notice how he says it. That in the ages to come, he, God, might show his, sorry, show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards What will heaven be like? I insist to you, it will not be as I was taught during most of my early years as a believer. Of course, our God is deserving of every moment of all of eternity, our worshiping and our devotion and our bringing glory to Him. And truthfully, I hope we'll still be doing all of that as we work, because the Bible indicates that there will be work for us to do. And for those of us who hate work, that doesn't sound happy, but the truth is, hey, work is really still very good. God delighted in Adam, who he loved so much, in giving him work. We are not much without big workers. My friends, in glory someday, things will be changed and work will be a joy because we're doing it more directly for God. And my friends, I'm indicating a little bit of my views about a couple things here, but I'm not a disbeliever in the potential, at least, that there are beings beyond us elsewhere in the universe. All I know is there's one God. I don't think there's huge amounts in the scriptures about this area. But it appears to me that we will have jobs, some of them very responsible jobs, some of them very needful jobs in the universe to influence for our God. And I believe, from this verse, I believe in the ages to come, it says, in the ages to come, I believe God will be referring to us and exhibiting us 
maybe on other worlds, testimonies to what God can do in perhaps another society, another people's lives. We'll return to that thought. But do you know this? We have a responsibility right now because God is pointing to us right now. We have a testimony. We are exhibits for Him. Look pointedly at the Lord's table. As Baptists, we definitely, definitely do not believe at all that the elements turn into the body and blood of Christ. Not a bit of that. But what is the reason for the Lord's table? I usually give you these three. One, simple obedience. Simple obedience every time we obey God and do this. We are promised that we receive from Him. As our heart is in it, we receive credit. We receive His pleasure. You know what? Obedience to God, He'll always report, be rewarded. Another reason is our memories. Our memories, it says again and again, doesn't it? Do this in remembrance of me. Do this to remember me. What a shame that we need a hook such as the Lord's table in these two steps of it. A hook that will help us hopefully to remember him. And yet apparently we do. And yet still some of us, we still take the Lord's table and we don't think of him as we might or all. So, obedience, also the memory, could be brought to our memories what Christ has done for us. And then third, we stress, as a testimony, that also there are those who are present who don't know Jesus, who don't know what it's about, and have never really had pictured to them in any way the Lord's table and what the cross was about. And by taking of the Lord's table, we represent that. We are, in a way, acting that before people as our hearts are committed to what this is about, we renew our consecration and we identify with what he did on the cross. We are testifying to others. We're saying, hey, this is the truth. So also, by the way, with all of our lives, our lives should always be full of a testimony of Christ and what he has done in it. In our lives. Others should see us and acknowledge a difference. Is there a difference in our lives between ourselves and the world? There should be. There should be an exhibition of someone doing something that nobody else has. May I say that when we face disease or some of the heartbreak, those are just as painful as experienced by anybody else in this world. But a believer needs to respond somehow differently. That others might have hope for themselves. There is someone to bring them through. Frankly, if we didn't have some of those troubles, most of us, hopefully overcoming them, being victorious still, by most of our friends, family members who are outside of Christ still, we have no representation, no one exhibiting anything about the Lord. But in this life, one of the reasons we are here is representing Him, exhibiting Him. We, each of us, an exhibit, exhibiting what has happened in us. Again, they used to say that what the unsaved need is to see a happy church and a happy marriage. But let me say, we're a society in our city, by the way, is so hugely single compared to what other, you know, sociological groupings. We have counting children, of course. We are hugely single. My single friend, you know, God needs to work in you and you need to be faithful even though it's hard because people need to know that there can be, there can be, if called for, sufficiently found in, in the Savior and waiting for that marriage ceremony in heaven someday, you and the Savior. But right now, we have need of a testimony. We ought to live differently. The statistics show that, that Christian marriages are dissolving at almost the same rate as any marriage around us in our society today. And what about child corruption and decision-making and all sorts of things of ethics? Is it 
it true that we find it impossible to live the Christ life in this our own generation when there is such need for an exhibit of honesty at whatever cost? There is great need. I was sort of pleased concerning two weeks ago Rick Hume speaking in an interview concerning Tiger Woods and recommending, apparently from his own belief as a Christian, that Tiger needs to give his life right now, somehow in the faith that involves a forgiving, loving Christ, Jesus Christ. And that he probably is not going to find anything at all like that in any other religion. I can admire that honestly. I hope his life backs that up. My friends, our call from God today is not to wait for heaven. We are exhibits for him right now. Our verse says, by the way, it says that our God is exceeding. He wants to show his exceeding riches. Now, what portion? He's rich in everything. So what portion of his riches does he especially want to promote? 